Hi, I'm Matthew Lorenzon. I was listening to the music of Franz Schubert. He's a 19th century Austrian composer who wrote over 600 lieder. I wanted to know more, so I looked him up online and found out he was gay. Or bi. Maybe. Which made me wonder, do I care? Should I care about the sexuality of any composer? So I called up someone who has thought about this a lot. Hi, I'm Miranda Hill, Artistic Director of Homophonic, Australia's longest running celebration of queer music. What does queer mean in this context? Any composer who identifies as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, gender diverse, any of the letters under that acronym. And why should sexuality or gender identity matter in music? When you're sitting in an audience, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But when you're a, a young queer person, and you're growing up like I did, I was a passionate classical musician and I loved the music, music of Polonk and uh, Tchaikovsky and Lully. And I was told to look up to these people as composers and for very good reason, but I was never told I could also look up to them as, uh, as queer people and as, you know, part of my own cultural lineage. And we talk about the romantic lives and sexual lives of our composers. You know, we're all obsessed with who's Be who Beethoven's immortal beloved was, you know, and Percy Granger's got a whole museum dedicated to his whips. This is a thing, but we don't talk about Tchaikovsky and these other composers in the same way. It's a form of straight washing. Straight washing, so that's like when a historian finds a picture of a clearly queer couple in history and says they were just really good friends, right? Best friends. I see that it's really important for young uh, emerging queer composers to see themselves reflected in the music community. But I wonder, does knowing about the sexuality of a composer change how you feel about their music when you hear it? Well, why don't you go do some reading, do some listening, find yourself a new favorite queer composer and find out. Okay, I'll, I'll do just that. Can I check in with you again when I'm finished? Oh, please do. I couldn't stop thinking about Schubert. Was he? Wasn't he? Does it matter? So I decided to talk to some people who've been performing and recording Schubert's music for years. David Greco and Erin Helliard, thank you for joining me. I read there's a bit of disagreement around Schubert's sexuality. Can you tell me once and for all, was Schubert gay? I'm not sure we're going to be able to illuminate you on that topic as not a lot is known about his sexual relationships except that he got syphilis from one. Okay, so when I'm listening to Schubert's music, I can just put any thought of his sexuality towards men or women out of my mind. It's irrelevant. I'm not sure if I'd say it's irrelevant. Um, the interesting thing about Schubert is in the 1810s, he came in contact with a whole bunch of older men. They came from wealthier backgrounds. They were all intellectuals, artists, painters, theatre folk. And we know that he had very intimate relationships with them. We're not sure if they're sexual, but there's a lot uh, of evidence in the letters that he wrote to them that there's sort of codes that suggest perhaps a homosexual relationship. Okay, so these were romantic relationships? Yeah, in one sense they were because it was the romantic period. People talked in heightened language to each other and these letters certainly come across as full of emotion and love. They lived together as well. And in fact, Schubert uh, shared a room with Meyerhofer as he did with Spaun and others. In fact, we have a description of uh, the conditions in which Schubert found himself with one of his friends and they write and say uh, we have two beds in one single room and a forte piano it's very cozy. So they were literally roommates? They were. Does this mean there are actually people out there who believe that in this artistic circle there was no homosexuality just because there are no graphic descriptions of sex? That's right. We have really clear images of a lot of composers. Mozart was really horny all the time, we have that in his letters. We know Bach had sex a lot because he had lots of children. And there's Beethoven and his immortal beloved. But Schubert, we don't really have a clear picture of Schubert. He's somewhat sanitized. And in the early 20th century, he was this sort of chocolate box Schubert, evocative of this nostalgic Vienna of the 19th century. That's a direct consequence of this group of friends because when Schubert died, they all closed ranks and they were desperate to protect Schubert's reputation. One of these guys was a slightly older fellow by the name of Meyerhofer, who was a poet. Now, Schubert set many of his um, poems to music, and they also had a really close friendship. They, they boarded together uh, in an apartment, and it's rumored that they might have had a relationship, a romantic relationship. Do we know if this is true? No, we don't. Um, 
but this song that we would like to sing for you uh, is called Nachtviolen, and uh, Meyerhofer wrote this poem uh, about purple violets. Now, is this song just about purple violets, or is it a song about a uh, sacred union? Is it a song about deep mutual respect and admiration? Um, and does knowing anything a little bit more about Schubert's sexuality influence uh, the meaning of this song? That's up to you. Yeah, I'm going for spiritual union with a moody poet over the purple flowers. We can't ask Schubert how he would like us to hear his music, so I asked a living queer composer point blank how they would like listeners to engage with their sexuality. Hello, I'm Deborah Cheatham. I'm artistic director of Short Black Opera. And a couple of years ago, when I was looking at updating my bio for the, I don't know how many times I've had to do it, I thought, I wanted to get more succinct, so here it is. I'm Yorta Yorta by birth, that's my heritage. I'm stolen generation by government policy. I'm a soprano by a whole lot of hard work and I would say diligence over many years. A composer by necessity. Where was the First Nations voice in our cultural landscape? And finally, I'm a lesbian by practice. I'm here on the lands of the Bunwarang people of the Eastern Kulin Nation, and I believe you're on Gadigal country. So uh, uh, I say greetings to you from uh, this land, and I pay my respects to our ancestors, past, present, emerging, and all those great leaders who've, who've given us the courage to be who we are today and to know this land in its fullest extent. How do you see your sexuality as playing a part in your career as a composer? My sexuality is fundamental to my identity, uh, as is my cultural heritage. And a long time ago now, 
uh, a seriously long time ago, back in my Sydney days, when I was still very much dislocated from my cultural heritage. Uh, as I mentioned in my brief bio, I'm stolen generation. I didn't grow up in my Aboriginal community or with my family. And so while I was still very much dislocated from that identity, it was the gay and lesbian community in, in the mid eighties in Sydney that welcomed me embraced me and celebrated my cultural heritage for the first time. My debut as a soprano was made in uh, the uh, Sydney Opera House, in the concert hall of the Sydney Opera House, and that was Lesbians in the House, which was part of the International Women's Festival. I sang the Luck Made Duet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and got a lot of um, very positive feedback, let's just say, <laughs> as a result of that. No, that was the beginning of my career as a soprano. How fortunate was I to have this, this loving and accepting and wildly enthusiastic community to embrace and uplift me. So listeners coming to your music now, should they know about your sexuality? Does that matter that they know about that to you? I think that an audience can appreciate the music that I write if they know nothing about me. But if, if they truly want to understand it and go on the journey of transformation that I intend in the work, then it is important that they understand who I am in, in every dimension. And that includes my sexuality, of course. Thank you so much for talking to me today, Deborah. No worries. Hey, Matthew. How was your big gay listening experience? Did you learn anything? I've been on such a journey. Um, I spoke to some Schubert experts and found out there are a bunch of people out there who insist on like forensic graphic evidence before they will admit that he had romantic feelings for men. It's also quite dramatic bisexual erasure. A man sleeping with one woman does not make him not gay <laughs> or not queer. And when they sang one of these songs for me, I heard it completely differently. It seemed so much more uh, profound knowing that there, those feelings were there. I mean, as a straight man, that story makes the music better. I mean, I hate to harp on with a slogan, but love is love. You understand romantic love, then you understand ro this romantic love. And that's something that we can all identify with. And I think you're very right there to deny ourselves of that understanding of this beautiful music solely to maintain some illusion of he pure heterosexuality means that we're denying ourselves access to these stories, these emotions and this music. So I wanted to get out of the historical world of combing through letters for clues about someone's sexuality, and I spoke to a living lesbian composer, Deborah Cheatham, an absolute icon. What really jumped out at me in the conversation with Deborah was the importance of the queer community in fostering her early creativity, because that seems to be what also happened with Schubert and his circle. The queer community seems to play an incredibly important role in supporting and, and nurturing creativity amongst composers. Queer culture, as you've learned and as you've said, is essential. It's a really important cultural heritage, but it's not passed down in the same way. We don't sit around a multi-generational dinner table at the holidays and hear those stories from our elders in the same way. So if we want our history to be written down, we want our history to be remembered, then we have to write it down. Otherwise, kind of relying on what Hollywood deems to be interesting enough to make a movie about. And that's a very different history to the history that I've experienced, that Schubert experienced, that John Cage experienced, that Deborah and David and Aaron have experienced. That's the true queer culture. And by writing it down and by celebrating ourselves as queer artists, we're creating that lineage for future generations. And no matter who you are, if you're not engaging with these stories, you're just missing out on a good thing. You know, if you want to engage on a deeper level with the music that you already love, you have to acknowledge all of, all of the artist. Miranda, thank you so much for being part of this journey. 
I'm always happy to be a gay musical tour guide. <laughs>